of expectation uh, that's going to give credence to miracles uh, and signs and wonders. Uh, and this is how God gets the glory. Uh, he identifies folk in the earth realm uh, who don't have the look. Uh, you, ain't, you ain't acting the part. Uh, you don't have the charisma. You don't have the skills. Uh, you don't have the intelligence. Uh, and he handpicks you uh, for a supernatural assignment. Uh, and then uh, he throws his weight around in your life. Uh, and he crowns you with glory uh, and puts honor on you. Uh, and you just come out of nowhere. How did you get that multi-million dollar contract? Uh, they don't know. Uh, you have been working behind the scenes. Uh, limited education. Uh, limited resources. Uh, limited connections. Uh, how did you build uh, on the west side of Chicago this multi-million dollar structure with a handful of so-called saints? Uh, because God gave the vision uh, and God supplied the resources for it. Uh, and God created the need. Uh, and then he stepped out of eternity into time uh, and prophesied our problem. Uh, I am God. Uh, and besides me, there is none other. That's why we have expectation uh, and we've been imagining, brother. We've been dreaming. Uh, we've been seeing ourselves stepping into a, a state-of-the-art facility uh, and we've done our part. Now God has to show up uh, and do his part. Uh, I don't know what you are believing God for, but I prophesy the seed uh, of expectation hitting uh, your spiritual womb. Uh, conceive uh, in the name of Jesus. Oh, God. We expect it. Unlike hope, hope, it, faith is the substance of things hopeful. You can't see it. It's the evidence of things you cannot see. Interestingly, you can have hope and there's no evidence. But you cannot have an expectation and there's no evidence. It's just like when you see a woman in the natural that's pregnant, you say, you expecting, huh? When's your due date? There's evidence. You can see uh, something is growing uh, inside of this person's body. Uh, and I'm telling you, we can see that thing growing. Uh, we can see that increase coming. Uh, we can see that goodness uh, overwhelming us. Uh, we can see uh, individuals being delivered from darkness. Uh, we see uh, these lost family members coming uh, out of bondage and captivity. Uh, we see multitudes uh, and multitudes uh, being equipped uh, to advance the kingdom of God. Uh, we see uh, resurrection power hitting uh, dead marriages dead households, uh, dead families. Uh, we see uh, broke people uh, coming into realms of increase. Uh, we see the disenfranchised uh, and we see those uh, that have lack uh, in their lives being empowered uh, supernaturally. Why? Because we are hardwired uh, to a vision that came from God. Uh, we are hardwired uh, and pregnant uh, with promise uh, and seeds of expectation uh, that came from God. Uh, and there's imagery in our minds. Uh, and it ain't about death and destruction. Uh, it's about life and hope. Uh, it's about presence and purpose. Uh, it's about power.
and said what about me for it appears that your hope has been under attack for the Lord says this day know that you have been marked and my hand is upon you this day for did not I say that hope deferred makes a heart sick but when the dream is fulfilled there is a tree of life for the Lord says unto you that I have removed the red tape from this house for that which has been difficult to gain your goals the Lord said that I release you into a greater strength for you even said unto the Lord it feels like you have forgotten me but did not I tell you that all of my promises towards you are still yes and amen but did not I tell you that the thoughts and plans that I have toward you they are good and not of evil to give you an expected end did not I tell you that when I look upon you I'll call you my own for this day the heavens are open upon you and I have not forgotten your labor of love in this house for the Lord says there'll be greatness that will come out of this house there'll be blessings that will come out of this house for the heavens are open and I have released the rain but you said Lord I have given I have given I have given but the Lord says I release the abundance of rain upon your seed and you shall come into the fulfillment of your harvest for many of you said God I'm building a house but what about my house the Lord says keep sacrificing but did not I say those who are willing and obedient they afraid. Do not lose hope. Do not lose your expectation. For here I am. Restoration is in the building. Miracles is in the building. Strength is in the building. Joy is in the building. Peace is in the building. Grace is in the building. I set you on fire for more. And I declare there's a death decree that came out of heaven for that your hope we say die to unexpectation this day your expectation is in me your joy is in me your strength is in me everything you need I shall provide my name is Jehovah Jireh and I will make provision for you in the name of Jesus today God we declare hope is fulfilled
God of goodness and mercy. Father, as we extend our hands and you die you on this morning, let there come the tangible manifestation of your goodness. Let it surround us and put us in a realm where everything we need to prosper, to be a people who excel in life, to be those that exercise dominion in the earth and model what it means to reign with Christ from a realm of excellence prevails. We give you glory for that. We thank you, Lord God, that that sweet-smelling aroma and fragrance that comes from our sacrifice and the breaking of our personal alabaster boxes has reached the nostrils of him in whom we have to do. So, Father, breathe into this ministry and let the Ruach of God come upon this house and empower us to be champions of, of Lord God Christ, these champions of Lord, situations and, tri and champions, Lord God, who prevail at all times. We bless and honor you for that today. And I thank you for increasing the stature of this people and making us robust as a corporate gathering of breakthrough believers. If you receive that, put your hands together and give our God praise and thank him for his goodness today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated, great people. Thank you so much for coming out to be a part of our gathering this morning. Uh, we are extremely privileged to be um, in a place where God's grace and presence is manifesting. Even though he is omnipresent, there are certain places he has abandoned, and we're grateful that he has not abandoned us. And so may the spirit of Ichabod be far from us as we continue to pursue him. Amen. Uh, we got a great word for you. We started an exciting new series in our 830 service dealing with destiny relationships. And we highlighted friends in the context of them being destiny helpers. The Lord gave us quite a bit of insight. Just a few maintenance items that we're covering. Uh, in the month of October, we're going to be transitioning into another temporary location uh, that will be the final uh, temporary location prior to the house of prayer being built. Uh, we wanted to... Um, Hallelujah. We really wanted to put our put us in put ourselves in a predicament. We're in a postmodern um, facility that kind of has all the trappings of what we'll be moving into to uh, constantly um, circumcise our appetite, keep our faith aligned with greater. Uh, it's important for us to really come into this season of building and doing so with maximum speed. It's going to require sacrifice. And uh, last week we. Um, had to receive a pledge. We're going to um, receive an offering at the end of this month. I believe July the 31st. Uh, where we're going, we got to pay six months in advance. And that's nothing for uh, breakthrough believers. Come on, you're still a breakthrough believer. And um, we had a budget uh, for that six months of about 20 plus thousand. 
And we had 16,000 in pledges and about 3,000 received. And so we need to do a little bit more uh, today. And what I want to ask is that all of you would get a We Build envelope. And you're going to check the box, one-time donation. And whatever you're inspired to, uh, to, to commit towards the pledge, we'll receive the offering, of course, on the 31st. We need you to do so. So that from an accounting perspective, we will know what the goal is, and then we can uh, fulfill that. We do not want to interfere with uh, money we currently have sitting um, in our We Build campaign that is geared towards the overall down payment and then the um, the um, soft construction costs, all that stuff that comes with that. we got to raise a substantial amount of money uh, within the next 8 to 10 months. Uh, but God is faithful. He's going to do it for us. Uh, because we're a people who have he, who he's deemed uh, worthy. And uh, I'm not really concerned about uh, the finances at this point. Uh, my concern is building people and making sure that we're doing our part in personal development. Um, so make sure you get a We Build envelope so we can cover that part. And we'll, we'll believe God and we'll go forward. Uh, my granddaughter is going to help me administer today uh, since she's my new best friend uh, next to her grandma. And... Um, so this morning we dealt with a very interesting aspect of um, relationships, once again, friendships. And we highlighted some of the highs and lows and the misnomers consistent with building healthy and productive friendships. And one of the caveats of ministry is the fact that sometimes you have to interact with people that you may not deem to be a friend. Or you carry some of the baggage from a failed relationship into uh, uh, the sacredness of a local church. And our interaction with that local assembly holistically is consistent with some of the baggage from a failed relationship in a previous place uh, with people that may no longer even exist in our lives. And we've got to become very skillful when it comes to building healthy friendships because everything in the realm of men is predicated on relationships. As a matter of fact, uh, in Psalm 8, uh, when the psalmist declares, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that you visited him. You made him more than the angels, God, but yet you crowned him with glory and honor. And this is important for us to understand that God's transactions with mankind come through men. In John chapter 2, I believe around verse 26, Jesus highlights the gift of God that's in man. And sometimes when we lack um, some specific things we covered in the 830 service necessary for developing healthy friendships, uh, we can really be put in a precarious situation or do things out of God's will and out of God's timing. We need to understand that discernment is a critical part of building functional friendships. Because with discernment, you can have clear distinction on who belongs in, the, in your life and who doesn't. And then for those that do belong, is this a casual interaction? Is it one of destiny? Or is it a burden-bearing relationship that is set for the endurance of time, which means that this person will be in my life permanently? There are people that God will send to you, and there are people God will send you to. The relationship is not transactional based on a moment, but it is eternal based on a mandate. And sometimes when there's failure to discern that because you may not look the part, or you may not carry what I deem is worthy of my presence and encounter, you can miss out on vital connections that eternity has sanctioned to elevate you. Every increase of God for us has come through another human. Don't deceive yourself. An angel didn't bring you that million dollars you needed, and that bag did not fall out of the sky. God didn't accidentally drop it out of eternity into time. It did not happen. God uses people, and when we can discern the gift of God in man, the interactions with people can take on a more meaningful purpose, and then we will have sensitivity on how to entreat each other. You know, one of the dangers of familiarity, uh, in the Hebrew, the word familiarity actually has to do with a family spirit. And in local church settings, one of the biblical themes of the New Testament church is family. You can become so familiar with people that have capacity in God and the authority they carry that you uh, vicariously violate the protocols of eternity. You dishonor the relationship and then it exists no more. This is a danger for us. And let me help you as a senior leader. I've experienced it where I've been challenged in my own walk in relating to those that have authority over me not to violate their office while dealing with their indifference or iniquities. Are you hearing me? And it did not come separate from pain because sometimes dealing with man 
can be a painful experience. Do you not know that some of the most influential people are some of the most difficult to deal with? Whether they got their influence legally or not, people of influence can be difficult to deal with. If you're a person that will get bent out of shape because no one responds to your text message, then you're not ready for next level relationships. You're not. Somebody don't like your post on social media and you thought that they were your covering and they're supposed to like and share and put hearts and comment on everything you do. You need to go back to Romper Room Ministries International and stay there and hang out with them folk from Zoom, Zoom, Zoom uh, that wore the black and white striped shirts. Because ministry can be painful. Ask Jesus. Serving people can cost you your life. Ask Jesus. Operating in dimensions of destiny that lead to the enhancement, welfare, lifting, uh, the increase, the breakthrough of others can, can lead you to death as Jesus. And Jesus tells his disciples who were servants, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. Because the servant does not know what his Lord doeth, but you know what I'm doing, therefore you are friends. And understanding that there are different dimensions of friendship and different realms of, of friendship there are spaces in your life that are sacred. They are reserved for God. And if God gives you permission to let others have access, you better discern them well. You better discern them well. Because as a local church, we've got to mature. This is a, a part of a big part of our growth is predicated on the quality relationships we build and the nature of those relationships in the context of the kingdom. Some of us have failed miserably at building relationships, not because you're a bad person. It's because you were fed bad intel vicariously through your family lineage. Why do you think when God called Abram, the first thing he tells him, get away from your kin folks, because they are a threat to the call of God upon your life. Some of us are so, you're so desirous of trying to build a relationship with a blood relative, and they got a ministry called Drag Me to Hell Ministries International. <laughs> you get around them, you're tempted to drink, you cuss, you do all kind of stuff that's forbidden in God, but this is my family. You gossip, you talk about folk in the ministry, you dog people out, leave them people alone and go. Can you imagine God telling Abram, go on get now, go on get. So when you're building healthy relationships, you need discernment. There must be honor, and it must be mutual. There must be honor where you can esteem people based on who they are versus what they do. Because some folk, as long as you do for them, you number one in their category. The moment you stop doing is the moment they'll cut you off. You got to pay for that friendship. So you have discernment, you have honor, and then there's value. There's value when you when you 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 relate to a person as a friend. You've got to see them being investment worthy. Well, you can invest in them emotionally, physically. You can invest in them romantically. Let's say if you're pursuing this person in the context of friendship and you deem them to be a spouse, is there compatibility? Because if there's no compatibility, then there will be no ROI on the investment. It will be frustration, vexation, always at odds and clashing like two he goats on the top of a mountain. And then commitment. Is there a mutual commitment where I can prioritize you as a friend and even at the point of sacrificing time to accommodate maybe a moment of agony you're going through? Maybe a need that I'm in close proximity or I'm not in close proximity, but I have a willingness to go far enough because I'm committed. I'll make the sacrifice to accommodate your need because the friendship warrants that I do so. If it's one dimensional, then it's not a friendship. It is bondage. As a lead pastor, opening my heart up. Loving people, embracing them, trying to see the gift of God in them, making room for them, seeking to accommodate them while managing my own personal life, uh, my own personal dysfunctions, household challenges, uh, and people never, if you cannot take the whole of me into consideration, you're not worthy of me. 
If I cannot take the whole of you into consideration, I'm not worthy of you. Don't see me as a means of transactional activity only. That's not friendship. So discernment, honor, value, commitment. And then you must be willing to make adjustments. Relating to other people as you grow in grace. I have friends where friendships have spanned over four decades almost. And we, you know, you get together as a youngster, you get married, you have children, grandchildren. We can't kick it like we used to before we had all of that. Adjustments have to be made. Are you listening to me? And sometimes people get stuck in seasons and you have got to make the painstaking decision by wisdom to reassess the boundaries. I'm not going to abandon you, but I am going to redefine these boundaries. No, I cannot go to the bar with you. No, I cannot go to the strip club with you. No, I cannot go hang out, shoot dice with you. We did that as youngsters, you know, I'm married, I'm in ministry. Oh, dog, come on, man. We can go shake them up one more time. No, you go shake it up. <laughs> I'm done shaking. Because real friends who are true in nature will never put you in a position to compromise your values. They won't put you in a position to compromise your values. That's why people who are seeking marriage need wise counsel. We're going to deal with the whole marriage relationship in, as this series progresses, but understanding the general basis, I'm going to paint with a broad brush in a few moments, of relationships and really targeting destiny helpers in the context of friendship with yourself being one is imperative for personal growth. Local churches cannot thrive when the membership does not have a revelation of friendship. Because we look at each other as just a means of transactional interaction. These are out of court saints. Because you got three dimensions of friendship, out of court, inner court, holy of holies. The transactional saint be a come, drop an offering, you know, prophesy, use their gift, and keep it moving. But then there's the inner court. Well, they're going to come, they're going to they gonna drop a sacrifice, and it's going to be systematic. They're going to participate, but yet they're going to give up themselves in the inner court. Come on, say connectivity. And then there's the holy of holies. These are the folk that bring God with them. <laughs> Whatever needs to be done, we're going to do it. And we're going to make sure we invoke the God of this mercy seat that everything this house needs. And from our lives, we build from the inside out. Those are three different tiers of relating and understanding that they are friends that will come into your life. They are simply general relationships. You meet them en route to work. You see them every week, several days. You finally greet them. They greet you. And it's just a general friendship. It's nothing other than that. No, we ain't hanging out after work. No, we're not doing nothing on the weekend. You are just the person I know that I commute to work with, and we have cordial interaction. That's general. Some people will mistake, that's my spouse. No, that's not your spouse. That's a person that is riding the train with you, going on about their life. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> they don't even see you like that. As a matter of fact, had you not said anything, they would not have said anything either. So take it for what it is. Now you need prophecy, therapy, shock treatment. You need all immunotherapy. You need all kind of stuff. Just eat. No. Don't bring that to the altar. Leave that on the train. <laughs> it was never supposed to leave there anyway. Then there are people God will send into your life for a season. They're destiny helpers. They will help you move into a realm of breakthrough. You know, here, here's the thing that we, about, about seasonal relationships is that sometimes they can end bad when familiarity gets into it. Remember Lot and Abram. When God called Abram, who did he call with him? No one. Who was the benefactor of the increase of God in Abram's life? Lot. When strife entered into the relationship, Lot was not willing to acquiesce and settle the affairs, not re re realizing of a surety, I'm rich because my uncle rich. I got what I got because of my uncle. He invited me into his realm. How dare I let these jack leg herdsmen uh, violate my relationship with them? That's, that's the kind of stuff with some saints I've dealt with. You, They come along, they link up with you, they get increased, uh, God grow them in grace. All of a sudden, uh, they don't see you as uncle. They don't see as a Pisces as equal. 
And when we build friendships, listen, hear me clearly. This is no, I'm not being sarcastic or no pun intended towards anyone. This is in the Bible. This is reality. And when you experience stuff, you can deal with it a little better. What God will do, though, is challenge us to teach stuff we have no experience in. So you can make mistakes in him, develop some courage and some faith. And when he needs you to speak to destiny and purpose, you can do so with the right kind of authority. This friendship stuff, I've endured. I, I, I can honestly say in the years of ministry, I have never dishonored a member connected to my authority verbally bashing them and tearing them down. But I've been a recipient of it. And when my flush <laughs> wanted to say stuff that make me transgress, I had enough dignity in the Holy Ghost. When, when he spoke to me, shut up, you're going to get into dishonor. I closed my mouth and I got a revelation then of weaponizing tears because that personality that was coming out of a bag when I began to weep and begin to lament and cry, another personality shifted and shut that devil down. And I knew then I'm free to walk away because no offense has been rendered on my part. Are y'all hearing me? And I could care less whether people remember what they do or not. I need to have a clean conscience. So that when a new person comes into my life, I don't size them up from a stronghold that's been developed from a flawed experience with the previous authority. We're talking about destiny helpers and friendship. A lot of us don't know what friends are. That's why I, I would tell my kids, everybody's not your friend. Stop identifying all these strays as being your friend. They're not your friends. They're people you talk to. What qualifies them to be a friend? <laughs> like when I hear men of God always identifying everybody's their son or daughter, it's, that's a, it's like, ah, that, that, that vexes me. It's like, how? You already look like a horrible husband. How could they, oh, you have all these sons and daughters? You know, I can see lust on you, greed, error. So what, what are we doing here, just breeding other greed, uh, greedy and folk full of error? <laughs> I mean, fathering someone is no small order. It's not. You better be very wise with folk. You, it's, it's just like I shared earlier, you know, Pastor Leonard and Pastor Kathy, they can call me son. I ain't offended by that. I receive them in their capacity of legitimate sources. But some of these other scrubs from a previous season want to try to put me in a category of a son. Man, get lost. You Buster from Buster Brown Ministries International, gone. Don't get. No. <laughs> I'm talking about listening to TLC. What about your friends? <laughs> friends. Da -dum -da -dum. How many of us have them? Friends, the ones we can depend on. Let me, y'all carnal up in here today, boy. Come on. Ain't nothing wrong with a little Houdini every now and then when you need to get a revelation of friendship. This is another one that was on the A-list. They smile in your face all the time. They want to take your place. Backstab. <laughs> Look at Elder Mike. That's all right. I took you back on that one. And I know we back on Thursday night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so there's some things that will help us build functional, sustainable friendships. Once again, we got to make sure that we are people who are discerning, people who understand honor and we render it, a people of value, we render it, and then the people who are committed. And then also we're willing to make adjustments. No relationship can work if you come into it with a rigid set of laws and rules you want to impose on people because there are no two people the same. You need flexibility. As long as it's not violating your core principles, you should be okay. Amen? All right, so let's go for um, some word here very quickly. Let's go to Proverbs 27, verse 17. We're going to look at two translations, the King James and then the voice. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. In the same way... This is, verse, this is the voice translation. In the same way that iron sharpens iron, a person sharpens the character of his friend. So when you think about countenance, we're really highlighting appearance. 
when you come into close proximity that just like iron, when these two metals come together, they sharpen one another, they create friction. Sometimes the presence of people in your life that are trusted friends will bring a sharpening to you. They'll help you get your cutting edge, your winning edge. They'll help produce an advantage for you. They will help open you up to resources. Uh, through them, you can step into realms and access uh, p perhaps uh, uh, just positions of influence, of visibility and power that you would not get apart from having them in your life to sharpen you. It's people that you're around accountability relationships where you give, you give, you give an account for your worth, your value, your time, your gifting, your calling. That's why it's important to have folk in your life that you know of friends indeed. In other words, they're trusted sources that can call you to the carpet when it comes down to you and your worth, your value, your standards. They know you. You know them. They have access to rebuke you, to correct you. They don't do it secretly. They can do it openly. You, you're working out with somebody. You're hanging out and eyeballs straying, and they've already shared with you that they, they're being challenged. You, you, they trust you because they share their struggles, not for you to be blasting them and talking about them behind their back. And let me tell you how wicked folk are. They are they, you can be in a vulnerable moment, and an indiscretion about your life is exposed. We've dealt with this with our leadership, with the previous leadership. And just systematic gossip about a moment of weakness that people begin to idolize. And now they were guilty of idol worship. And you cannot build with people like that. And what God will do, he'll get them out of your life. God will remove them. Because your job, stay in honor. You keep on doing what you do. Don't let people change you. Because if people have the capacity to change you, you were never true to who you said you were. Like if you say you're an honorable person and dishonor comes your way, you don't, you don't fight fire with fire. You let the God who answers by fire fight for you. And you stay in honor to the point where sometimes it can humiliate you and all your ghetto-isms come when they start rising. You just see you out there, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. You feel a rising coming. It ain't the whole, that didn't come from your Shondo realm. That came from that Bonchiqua and Freaky Freddy realm. <laughs> the wrong kind of rising. And you can remain true to who you are. God then identifies you as a friend. Because even in your vulnerability, brokenness and weakness, you didn't violate your friendship with him. This is important. This is important for us. Now, this whole sharpening dimension. Friend correlates with an associate, a brother, companion. Uh, it could be a husband, a wife, a lover, or a neighbor. And let me qualify the whole lover thing. It's got to be love in the context of the marital covenant between he and she. Not you, me, and he. What are we going to do, baby? Not, not, not them. See, the youngsters don't know nothing about him to me. So we, we ain't, I'm not going to message y'all with that. Let's keep it right here. Let me keep it moving. The people we call friends... Uh, and their contributions in our lives over a period of time should yield a better us and a better them. When you have real friendships, that friendship is going to increase your capacity and make you better. And your commitment to be a friend to others is going to in increase their capacity and make them better. That's the way it works. Spouses should have it in ministry relationships, business relationships, because some of the most ruthless people you will ever encounter when you factor in monetary gain, you, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money in itself is not evil. But what money will do is provide opportunities for the evil in a person to really be what it is. You thought they was humble. No, that, that wolf been in there. That wolf was just broke. <laughs> that wolf got some money. That wolf start ravining like a wolf. We need friends that can sharpen our character. Life at times comes with its own unique twists, deviations away from plans, and challenges, and even hardships. But it's nothing like having a friend during those pivotal moments that can help you make the right type of pivot that's quality in nature. Anybody ever been around folk that have just given you bad counsel? You looking at them like, why are you going to lie to me in my face like that? Man, I'm with you, dog. I'm with you. You lying. You ain't, 
you, you lost your teeth in the third grade. It never grew back. You lying through your gums, man. Why are you going to look me in my face? And li- I ain't seen you since the last time you came begging, trying to get something up out me. I told you I got a limit with you, man, $5. You asked me for $5 and some change. It ain't there. <laughs> you don't throw them away because you know they're going to lie to you anyway. But because you still love them, but you have a measure. You have to know this is how this works. But life at times can be very difficult. You need trusted soul who can sharpen you. I'm talking about folk you can divulge some of your darkest items to, and you know it's safe with them. Ask yourself, do you have people like that in your life? They won't even tell their spouse. I know my wife, my wife, she give me these, look, man, I'm not going to play Inspector Clouseau with you. Either you're going to tell me what's happening or you ain't. Well, that's okay. That's okay. And that's because when people share stuff with her, she won't tell. And it's like the same thing. It's like relationship you have of value and meaning. You're not, what real friend is going to take your weaknesses and go gossip to somebody else about them? They already praying for you anyway, carrying you in their spirit. And when you come to them, their hearts are open and flowing with the compassion you need to really break through. All of us need people like if you don't have them, ask yourself why. Two are better than one. A threefold cord is not easily broken. But woe unto him that when he falls, he's alone. We need friends. I'm not talking about people who are charismatic maniacs, demented, delusional, paranoid, and everything they do and their rising is consistent with a trail of broken relationships and people that are still reeling in the aftermath of emotional torture, torment, just defilement, destruction, and things have been said to bury them, to destroy them. I'm not talking about folk that have risen like that because in all relationships, a sacrifice is required. What God are you sacrificing to to make the relationship work? See, the rising and the lifting of men is directly connected to a sacrifice. And everybody ain't sacrificing to the God of the spirits of all flesh. Some folk are going into the dark realm. And they're trying to, and and they're using the name of Jesus. And they're casting out devils and prophesying and moving in miracles. And we are moved by what we see and think that's a connection for us. But Jesus makes it clear. I'm going to say to you, depart from me. You work of iniquity. I never knew you. In other words, you did what you did in my name, but you were not my friend. It's during times of adversity that authentic friends emerge and they'll yield their best. I've experienced exceptional uh, just impartations from authentic friends during very challenging times. Beware of people in your life. That when pain is exposed, they agree with your disagreements. In other words, you have disagreements about God, about your local church, and they subtly start agreeing with it. It's like, no, mm -mm, mm. you ain't going to be able to tell me you tired of the church. Because just go ahead and call it what it is. You tired of your cultish activity or that coven that you became a part of, and you knew it was a witch over it. You just hung around it. Don't make no blanket statements and talk about my Jesus church. Now, please help me identify which one you're talking about. Are you talking about the one you built it? Or are you talking about the one he built that's hell-proof, that can never be destroyed? It's destruction-proof. Now, you are not going to be able to talk about that. You know what? That's going to destroy our relationship because I'm not going to be a recipient of these holy ears and your seeds of discord and bondage about people who have been paid for by blood. Because that sacrifice still speaks. We're talking about real friendships. We all need them. We all need trusted, functional friends who have risen above their personal indiscretions and dysfunctions and are now a credible source. I can connect to you and grow. You connect to me, I'm grown. Is mutual. Are we together? Okay, let's move on. Genuine friends prove to be invaluable during times of fiery trials. When your faith is being tested, the last person you need is a doubting Thomas Didymus. Yeah, it's amazing how it ain't no warfare. You ain't going through no hell. Everybody got the word of the Lord. 
Then the moment you really going through something to hear from God, them jokers, do 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 that music that played when please hold the line, do 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 do. Proverbs 16, 27 through 29, I want to highlight four types of people that all of us need to be intentional about avoiding when it comes to developing friendships. You cannot build trusted friendships with these types of people. An ungodly man diggeth up evil, and his lips, and in his lips there is a burning fire. A froward man soweth strife, and a whisperer separated chief friends. A violent man enticeth his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. In the text, there are four types of people all of us need to be acutely aware of and avoid seeking to build a friendship with. You know, here's one of the problems. When we think we can fix broken people, you have to realize that there's a caveat that comes with dealing with people who have not put themselves in a trajectory to be healed and made whole. There will be evidence, and you still must be very discerning because Christ is the healer, not you. He'll do the healing through you, but he's the source of the healing. So don't do things prematurely to try to help folk that don't want to be helped because you think you can make them a worthy mate or a spouse. Oh, no, no, no. Especially for you that are looking for re really just people who are marriage material. You, I don't want no marriage material. That means you can get the stuff for the roof and the walls and you're missing the floor and everything else. You just got part of the material. <laughs> You know, Jesus tells us something very powerful. He says, what man seeking to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost? You better look, if that joker ungodly now and been in church all his or her life, ain't too much you can do with that. Back up off it and just pray for an encounter and keep it moving. The first type is ungodly. Interestingly, it comes from the Hebrew word belial, which translates the same thing in English, belial. What concord have Christ and belial? In other words, Jesus is saying through the apostle Paul that there is no mutual agreement between belial and Christ. Remember when King Ahab was coveting the vineyard of this man next to him? Was it Nabal? What was his name? Help me out, scholars. The guy who... It ain't Nabal, neighbor. He, so he was coveting his vineyard, and the man wouldn't sell it to him. He's like, no. There are certain entities that are so wicked in nature, they don't want no one else thriving around them. And so they will seek to get you to abdicate your inheritance to feed their covetous desires. The man says, no, this is my inheritance. So what did he do? He put on a sad face, and his, his, his wife, Jezebel, activated the sons of Belial. They took the man's stuff by force. They forged some bogus letter. And that's what happens. So here, when you talk about ungodly men, ungodly people, an ungodly woman, man of God, you cannot build a friendship that will become a perhaps marital covenant material or behavioral activity, however you want to term it, with the ungodly woman. Woman of God? Stop dumbing down all the sacrifices you've made to get to where you are, the painstaking effort you put in to become a professional, to get healed from background bondage, to liberate yourself from garbage, to work your way out of poverty. Now you've risen to a certain status. You will not change him. He will drag you through the mud. All right. It's important. Sometimes delusion tells us we can fix people. I rebuke the fixer spirit. If they have not yielded to the power of Christ like you and got their hearts right with him, what makes you think there's going to be fidelity to you? You'll be on this altar barking like a sea lion and throwing up all kind of stuff from Sesame Street. It, you know, we Don't wear us out with that. Belial translates worthless, good for nothing, unprofitable, a base fellow, wicked, also destruction. So Solomon says an ungodly man diggeth up evil 
and in his lips there's a burning fire. In other words, the stuff that will come out of their mouths at any given time could consume you emotionally, could overwhelm you psychologically, could wear you out and torment you mentally. You don't need that stuff in your life, people of God. You cannot build a functional friendship with an ungodly person. <laughs> You cannot build a functional friendship with an ungodly person. Here's a picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a person who is, this, Solomon, David says this in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor does he stand in the way of sinners and sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate when? Day and night. And he shall be like what? A tree that's planted by the waters. His leaves won't wither. Whatever you do will prosper. You'll bring forth fruit in his season. We're talking about pro a productive life. Why would you try to integrate that with something that's worthless? That's good for nothing. You got three baby mamas and you think that there's going to be a pledge of allegiance to you and your womb? You crazy. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to this womb. No. <laughs> Let me, the second one a froward man Solomon says a froward man soweth strife the first reference to strife led to a covenant being broken a covenant being broken you cannot deal with froward people that sow strife froward is, a, is an interesting word in the Hebrew. It means perversity or fraud. In other words, just because he has on a suit and tie and carries a leather Gucci attaché case, the case is empty. He doesn't just study your profile and found out what you like. Joker been on your Facebook page, everything you don't like, he done created a fraud and slithered right on into your space. Psst. But he's a fraud. That's why you got to bring them to your brothers. Because if you feel you, you building a friendship in secret. Open rebuke. Bring him on. Nope, he ain't the one. Hey, bro, how you doing? I, I'm, I'm all right. Them demons won't even let him look. I'm, I'm doing good. Man of God, you done been through too much. Don't be going out on no dates. First place you want to take you to a wine tasting venue. But you got a spirit of alcoholism in your bloodline. And you used to be one of them fall off the bar stool drunks. <laughs> Why would you link up with that? That devil will send folk into your life to destroy you. Because he sees you trending in the wrong direction as far as the kingdom of darkness is concerned. Be, be very wise. That type of person will mess you up the forward. Then the whisperer. It means to murmur. It also talks about a backbiter, a slanderer, a talebearer. Six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination unto him. When there's discord that's sown among the brethren, God hates that. And that whisperer is a proponent of sowing discord. You cannot build a functional friendship with a person who has an appetite for gossip, slander, and tailbearing because it's just a matter of time before you on the rotisserie. And then the violent man. A violent man entices his neighbor and leadeth him in the way that is not good. You out, you loving God, and you trying to deal with him, and you know there's a tendency you to see the anger and the violence and all that. Then all of a sudden, you out in a public place, and this spirit of violence jump on them, and they mess around and hit King Kong. And King Kong turn around and put King Kong on you. You done got raccoon eyes, you laying up in a body casket because you hanging out with a violent man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm throwing the humor in here, but when you see that stuff trending in a person, you need to know, I can't hang out with a violent man. Evil shall hunt the violent man. I am not invested in a relationship with a violent person. Stay away from them. They violent, full of rage. 
and then say something to another person who is violent and full of rage, and you become a casualty of their violence and rage remotely. It's important. It's very, very important. You, you, you and I are not called to change folk like that. Let the altar deal with them. Let the altar pr produce the encounter they need to change them. Let weeping and repentance and encounter with Christ shift that individual, not you. I rebuke again that fixer demon that wants to sit on us and have us to gaze people and size them and think that we are their change agent. You ain't nobody's change agent. You couldn't even help you. It took an intervention. You cried out to God because you know you had to die to that thing and God had to help you. The Lord is my helper. <laughs> Proverbs 13, 20. He that, walketh with the wise, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. The message translation, become wise by walking with the wise. Hang out with fools and watch your life fall to pieces. Amplified classic version. He who walks as a companion with wise men is wise, but he who associates with self-confident fools is a fool himself and shall smart for it. Very interesting. So when you think in terms of walking with the wise, we're talking about associations, connections, contacts, people that you develop ties with. Make sure that they're wise. Proverbs chapter 9 highlights about six or seven dimensions of wisdom. Wisdom that hews out on seven pillars. Wisdom that furnishes a table. Wisdom that mingles a wine. Wisdom that cries from the high places of the city. Wisdom that sends forth her maidens. Uh, there's different dimensions of wisdom. Get around wise people. Wisdom is a gift from God. Wisdom is one of the seven manifestations of the spirit of God in the person of Jesus. Wisdom is a credible source. Wisdom is too high for a fool. A lot of times we put ourselves in a compromising state based on the associations that we forge and the company that we keep. If you know that your value has been earmarked by eternity and a price has been paid for you personally to get to where you are in life, why squander that on a fool? Once again, the best way to discern what's in a person's life, you got to give ear to what they say. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Eventually, they're going to let you know exactly where they're at. It's important. It's very, very important to become a qualitative person that is friendship worthy. You have to realize everybody's not friendship worthy. You have gotten to a certain realm where you can no longer afford to let certain types of people into your sacred space. It doesn't make you better than them. It simply just makes you wise. It makes you wise. Let, don't let anybody put you on the guilt trip, especially family members. You think you're better than us. God bless you. God bless you, auntie. God bless you, auntie. You know I don't smoke crack, no boy. Every time I come around, you're trying to get me to smoke crack. God bless you, auntie. Now go on here and finish smoking the rest of your teeth out your mouth and everything else you're doing. Just go on on. You got that one little raunchy cousin always trying to get you into places. You ain't got no business going. You just, you, you, now that you done, you, done, you done got your little job, you, you done making your little money, you don't know nobody no more. You are absolutely right. I do not know you. Please enlighten me. <laughs> don't let family members put you on a guilt trip. You was the best cousin on the planet as long as you was buying all the beer and doing all the other stuff that you were funding their bondage. The moment you start financing their bondage, then you became a bad person. You think you better than everybody. You know, I, I got family. Like, all of us got family like that. Some of y'all, y'all yield to that bondage, and then you get caught up, and then you, you need fuller soap. You need to be purified by fire. You got to come and lay prostrate on the altar. Just cut them folk out your life. They are not relationship worthy. Leave them in the general category. And don't feel no harm. <laughs> Walking with the wise makes us wise. It's a central thing to our growth as a people of purpose and destiny. Get around wise people. Hell will seek to deploy the wrong people into our lives with the goal of rendering destruction and ruin. Be wise. Understanding the power of associations 
when developing friendships is a matter of life and death. From my point of view, it's important. Sometimes it's like, you know, I'm at a pivotal junction in life. You know, I better not try to childhood friend. You're not a threat to anything. But I don't have the time to invest in rehashing memories from the 80s. Come to church. I'm fellowshipping over here. And when they come, you got to find one of them demon busters, divert them right to them. <laughs> I'm talking with some class and dignity. Though. Don't send them to the wrong one because, you, you know, you, you got to be you got to be wise. You have some folk they meet in the house of God. They'll never come back again. And other personalities, man, they can get with them. You know, you got to be that you deploy the wisdom of the serpent. Here's some benefits of walking with uh, walking in wisdom and with the wise relationship wise. Number one, take note. Wisdom to love beyond and above the challenges that are common to uh, the success of relationships comes when you walk with the wise. Because there's impartation through association. Normally, we gravitate towards people where we see value or similarities or likes in them we ascribe to. We got to get a desire for wisdom. So walk what wisdom to love beyond and above the challenges that are common to all uh, to the success of all relationships really comes when you walk with wise people. There can be insight given. I remember talking to uh, one of the saints and, and encouraging them, you know, give this person another chance. Sometimes people can do things at critical moments of their life that we could deem to be foolish, but they're not foolish people. They don't have a track record of being foolish. They're just in a bad moment. They, 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 they see through a series of indiscretions, a bad moment is there, but that's not who they are. And the only way that relationship can be salvaged and work, it requires humility. When dishonor, disloyalty, infidelity, betrayal, all that stuff can be fixed when humility is factored in and there's a revelation of honor. When those things are lacking, the relationship is graveyard dead. Are y'all hearing me? Because some people think time heals. Time does not heal. Reconciliation with, with repentance heals. <laughs> Forgiveness, abandonment of behavior that led to the failure of the relationship heals. Walk with the wise and get wisdom for relationship number two. Wisdom to build and develop times of intentional interaction for the health and sustainability of a relationship can be imparted when you walk with the wise. Sometimes we don't even know what a healthy relationship looks like. Get around wise people who have a track record of sustainable friendships. I'll read it again. Wisdom to build and develop times of intentional interaction for the health and sustainability of a relationship can come when you walk with wise people who have built those type of relationships. You know, one of the, one of, one of the, one of the worst things in a re relationship wise you could ever be involved in is that you're in a relationship you're afraid to leave that's producing you nothing but pain. And you feel out of some demonic obligation you got to stay in it. That's this thing called the Stockholm Syndrome where the victim develops empathy for the perpetrator. How could you, this, this joker has bankrupt you. How could you dare feel sorry for them? They have reduced you, emasculated you, man. Did all kinds of crazy stuff and continue to do it. And now all of a sudden, you got some demonized compassion from them. I rebuke you and the lion spirit working in you. Get out of that garbage. It's, it's important. And sometimes you need wise people who can lovingly and graciously impart wisdom. And walk with you for a season. For you to grow, mature, and come out of things that are detrimental to your life. Here's another one. Wisdom for skill to properly displace relationship killers and destiny destroyers can come when you walk with wise people. You see, there are things that could be in a person's marriage. And it's in them that could kill their marriage. There could be things in a child that's an adult child that could kill their connection to their parents, their aging parents, and they don't want to humble themselves. They, they forge a connection with someone who is wise. They abandon being a companion of fools, uh, and through the impartation of wisdom, they can begin to displace the relationship killer and the destiny destroyer and restore the breach with their parents. 
It takes wisdom. You have to realize is that a lot of times no relationship can thrive when there's no humility. No relationship is going to work when there's no humility. And, and one, of the, one of the caveats of dealing, dealing with people who, 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 who are gifted is sometimes people will conceal stuff and say the Lord told them to do it. How are you going to conceal something that could potentially kill a relationship and all we need to do is just talk about it, but there's no humility. So I don't honor you enough to really share what's in my heart detail. Mm. I'm just going to plot to do what I'm going to do and let the chips fall where they may. Well, that means you never really loved me to begin with. Or maybe you did, but something breached the love. Can we deal with that part first? I talked about how when vision grows in a person, that's contrary to, let's just say you're in a family, right? Your family said, you got a vision growing in you that's not the vision of the family. You know what that vision is going to do? It's going to produce division. It's going to produce division. Right. Here's another one. Wisdom for discerning and properly addressing wrong associations um, that, that can be destructive, deceptive, and draining can be released and imparted when you walk with the wise. Some of us are dealing with folk right now. They draining the life out of us, but you love their dirty draws. You love them to a fault. And there's nothing wrong with that because it could be a child that you, that, that, that you nurtured, that came from your loins. But it's just like as a parent, you're just a sucker for them. You got a soft spot. And that wisdom can come through your spouse. It can come through a parent to you to deal with your children. Because the relationship itself if it's legitimate, it's always going to add to you and not take away. And so your eyes can be open and you will, you will express or you'll expose the right kind of information so you can get the right kind of results. Is anybody learning anything? I want to make sure that we're, that we're growing because this, this is important. And most of these life lessons I have learned have come through experience in the body of Christ and also outside. Just reflection on the progression of life, some of the pivotal things that have happened, some of the shifts that have taken place, some of the misnomers that I was utilizing that were totally erroneous. As you grow in grace, there's an impartation of wisdom that comes because Jesus himself, Luke 2.52, and the child, Jesus grew in, 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 in wisdom and in favor, and he, and he increased in stature with God and with man. So there's a realm of grace that facilitates growth with wisdom. Are we together? Okay, here's another one, and I'm closing. Wisdom for purifying your life of unhealthy connections that have served as a source of instability. Anybody dealt with folk, every time you get with them, you just feel so unstable. I know that's not for everybody, because I, I, I've had folks like, man, I get through dealing with you, feel like I've been on a seesaw. It's like, God help me, when folks' minds are all over the place and you're trying to find the right mind to relate to uh, in that conversation, it can be challenging and you need wisdom. Get around wise people because there's certain aspects of people's lives that's not investment worthy. I will not invest in your addiction. That means no money can be transacted between me and you. What do you need? I will get it for you. And I'm going to Walmart. So I can decrease his street value. Well, my wife going to go to Walmart because I don't go to Walmart. I'm a Target kind of guy. She calls me bougie. It's like I done graduated. I can't help it, you know. <laughs> Be like Tommy from Martin. You know, I like the finer things of life. <laughs> You ain't going to find that Target either. So let me, let me, this last point of emphasis and then we're done and we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for those that have been struggling, you know, with developing quality relationships or those of us who are currently in warfare with parental, spousal, or business relationships and you need an impartation of grace to progress and move forward. Proverbs 17, 9, we want to be weary of these repeat offenders. Proverbs 17, now, he that cover the transgression seeketh love. But he that repeated the matter separated very friends. Repeat offenders aren't worthy of friendship. Once transgressions are present and begin to present themselves in systematic cycles, you better beware. So in other words, here's something I haven't seen. 
one time, two time, three time, four time, is producing grief, and I know it's a transgression. Let me deal with it by way of love to see if repentance can be procured and it's just something oblivious to that individual. But if they keep repeating it, then you need to pay attention because that repeat offender is going to eventually become a detriment to the relationship. Or if you have been dealing with them from an outer court experience and they're knocking on the inner court door, you better be wary. Let me not give you this kind of access to me because I've seen stuff over the tenure of us interacting with each other generally. I don't think you are intimate worthy. In other words, intimate space. No, you can't come to my house. <laughs> Where you live at? Up the street, across the creek, around the corner? <laughs> What's your address? 316 John? <laughs> what, what city? Zion? <laughs> What's the name of the county? Kingdom? Listen, when it comes down to these cycles, you got to weigh in motives and intentions. And here's some questions I want to pose to you. Take note of these because you got to be courageous. If someone wants access to you and, or you're seeking access, you need to be willing to answer these questions as well. Number one, what's your intention for seeking to be my friend or significant other? There's nothing wrong with that. What's your intention? Remember, because discernment is a critical part or core of building a functional friendship. So let them talk. Sometimes if the conversation is evasive, subpar, walk away. Walk away. Because you can't talk to me about things that are the benefits of a relationship, but you cannot express to me your value for me. Does this make sense? So let me say this. Motives don't lie, and it's wise to simply ask hard questions now and avoid pain that's deferred but sure to come. So, question number one, what's your intention for seeking to be my friend slash significant other? You can ask. Just ask them. Number two, why should I invest in building a relationship with you? Uh, uh, uh. A duh, uh, uh. <laughs> yeah, you already know. Because when a person has a value for you, you know what they're going to articulate? Your value. They're going to articulate their value for you. Remember now, going back to the four things we need. We need discernment, honor, value, commitment. And the fifth thing, you got to be adjustable. But you definitely need to, you need to hear them say it. And then you need capacity to say it as well. Is anybody learning anything? See, what we've done, to, you know, you got a friend that knows somebody, they think y'all, you ain't the matchmaker. Because you ain't got a relationship that's been sustained permanently besides me and you, and I don't even know why I'm still with you. Now you want to try to hook me up with somebody. Man, loose here. I got a cousin. No, bro. If they anything like you, I know I don't want to be bothered with them. Number three, how can I vet what you're saying is true? Give me some sources. Because people who are real and candid and transparent and have nothing to hide and their motives are pure. You know what? How about you call my mom? She won't lie. Call my dad. Here's his number. I'm going to let him know you're going to call. Because they've already built a rapport. Look, I'm in this thing and... It may be such and such, I'm going to use you as a character reference. And I know, and Dad, I need you to listen to him now because I want to make the right decision. I got you, baby. <laughs> Bring him on. <laughs> I, 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 I told one of, the, one of our spiritual daughters here, I forbid you from interacting with this personality. You've done too much to get your life together. No to this one. And any other one I find out about, once I get a whiff of what they own, I'll let you know. Because we built that kind of rapport. 
See, the last thing I want to see as a pastor is any, any respective member of the congregation, and I know my wife and the Andersons share the same sentiments, is to see you fail relationally, and then your commitment to God suffers. You better realize that when stuff goes wrong with people we relate to, the first thing that's affected is our commitment to the things of God. Now, let me, let me highlight what bad intentions produce or what's the product of bad intentions, the pressures of life. Some people in a place in life, they're just tired of being alone. They don't want to be lonely. You know, they, they're tired of, uh, you know, being single. They got pressure on them. And they're hearing it from their parents. They're hearing it from their peers. They're looking at other folk. And they, now, now it's pressure. And so now I'm not driven by the power of covenant. I'm driven by the pressures of life. That stuff is rooted in a bad intention. Uh, you could be struggling financially. You see a joker, man, she looked like she got some paper. He looked like he got a little something. Said, That's your car? What you drive? Okay. Can I sit in it? <laughs> Smell new up in here. You just got this? I was just looking at this, too, on the website. Man, this is, this is this cost you a pretty penny, huh? Yeah. They looking at you because they want an advantage, which friendships, when they're done righteously, will produce. But your motivation is unclean because you're driven by need. I have gone so much past my time, saints. Can I give you five more minutes? Just five more. Five more minutes and we're done. When you're desperate to change your status, everybody, you, 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 you kick it with, then got their boo thing. And you crying out, Jesus, when my change going to come? But Jesus has been trying to get you to balance your checkbook. Jesus has been trying to get you to take care of your health. Jesus has been trying to get you to get your household together. Jesus has been trying to get you to go back to school, to get your degree. Jesus has been trying to get you to reconcile with your parents. Jesus has been trying to get you to settle your indifferences and the stuff you had from the previous relationship, but you crying because you're looking at everybody else and want your status to change. That's a bad intention. It's a wrong motive. Let's stand to our feet. I got to let it go. I got to let it go. Can we put our hands together and bless the Lord? Y'all been a pretty good class today. This is hitting kind of different, isn't it? Yeah. We got to become healthy when it comes down to relationships. It's never too late to start. What are the four areas, once again? With the, with the fifth one, the first, discernment, honor, value, commitment, and adjustments. And let me say this. This is my last closing. You cannot develop a healthy relationship with people who stop contributing to the relationship. The moment they are no longer a willful contributor, the relationship is dead. It's dead. Let's lift our hands. Father, we thank you for our time together this afternoon. We uh, trust you, Lord, for a continual deposits of grace and impartation that will empower us to rise as a people of the word, a people of the spirit. Let there come a newfound passion for building healthy relationships and transcending friendships that will endure. Give us wisdom to discern the fair weather friends, the fickle ones, and to invest in the faithful. We trust you, Lord God, for sustainable growth in this realm of relationships, whether it's marital, business, professional, social, or spiritual. God, you provide the guidance we need, and you give us all that's required of us in this season to be that formidable source for functional and sustainable friendships. Let wisdom be our portion and empower us to walk with the wise and no longer be companions with fools or a discerning dimension to know when fools are seeking to access sacred space. We desire to be healthy from within. We desire to be healthy from without. We desire to be healthy in our interactions one with another. And so, Father, let there come a wisdom and understanding of placement value and let courage be wrought in this house to do such things where we will not give access to the sacred spaces where painstaking effort with tears has been sown for growth. We'll not waste that on things that are not worthy of your presence. We bless you for that. We give you glory and honor for that. 
And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. To our online audience, we bless you. We thank God for you. Trust God in the days that come to get in the building and be a part of the physical gatherings. Uh, we want to encourage you to invest in what we're doing here in River Chicago. All the information for you to do so will be put on the screen. More grace and God bless. Those who need to leave, I speak a benediction.